I do thank you for joining us again today as we hear from God's word and kind of try to make sense out of what is going on and reflecting how God speaks into this. So thank you for being there. And again, I encourage you to reach out to Amanda and Valerie and Pastor Terry as they're hosting. And if you have questions, they can talk with you while we're walking through this. But our world continues to change rapidly. What happens around the world we think should be around there, but it's come to America and it's come to our metro area and it keeps coming in close and it knows no boundaries around us. It's changed the way of our life. It's affected our economy, it's affected our jobs, it's affected our schools, affected upcoming graduations and birthdays and anniversaries and weddings and it knows no stop. It just seems like it keeps moving in. I'm very, very thankful for our leaders who are making very difficult and tough decisions for our well-being and to try to curb the impact of this virus on America and our lives. I'm very thankful for the scientists who are working so hard to try to come up with an antidote, a cure for this, to stop the spread. And I'm thankful for our medical teams who are giving so much and giving their all for us. We see some things that are working at their best, but our normal, our normal has changed. Everything's different around us. What it seemed like it was somewhere else is here, and tragedy and pandemic is something that's been a part of our history, but it should remain in our history books. We read about it, sometimes they're just numbers. I looked at some of those this week. The Spanish flu, just 100 years ago, back in the 1920s, came and it took 500 million lives. I cannot have fathomed that many people. The Asian flu came in the 1950s, not that many years ago, took 1.1 million lives, 116,000 here in the United States of America. And back in the 80s, we had this horrible thing called AIDS that came in and it came with great fear as it spread. And it's still continuing in some parts of the country and it has taken 34 million lives. What a tragedy, because every person has a name, those numbers. There's been SARS and swine flu and Ebola. And then now we have this COVID-19 that's come in and knows no boundaries of any countries. It knows no age. And it's here. It's one that's striking is with fear. And we ask, where is God in all this? Well, he is here. He's not caught off guard like, by this like we were. And he's here and he's working. And I believe he is working through tragedy and adversity. He did not bring COVID-19 upon us. He did not bring it into the world. But he's here working even in the midst of it. And all of us who have put so much trust in our economy and our 401ks and all the security that we have with our health and what we're doing well, it's our whole world is shaken. And it's time when we stop and we look to God for trust and direction. I believe he's speaking to Christians and he wants our attention as well. We talk about our faith and our walk with him. This is a time when we are being tested a little bit. Do we really trust God with today and tomorrow? Do we really lean upon him? And when we're losing all the things of our security around us, do we believe God is the one who's ultimately going to provide for us? And he is. Just most times we stop, we remember, we recheck. Do we really believe and walk with him? Some of you, are, I, I look at your post, I hear from you, you're actually doing well. I love hearing how families are reconnecting and how you're working together and learning what this homeschool thing is all about and how you're helping your kids and interacting and husbands and wives, you're eating meals together like you haven't been for a long time. So there's been some really good things that come out of this tragedy as we reconnect and figure out life in a whole different way. But there's also some of us who are under a great amount of fear. And before we judge each other, some of us have been through some great tragedies in the past, and the expectance of grief that could come upon us reminds us of grief that's been there before. 
And it brings out these stirs of emotions that's hard to deal with. But even in these times, God is with us and we can trust him. We can walk with him. It's a time when we can see, are we being generous? We think we are when times are in abundance, but when things are difficult, when our job is gone, our security is gone, can you still be generous? When you meet people this week that are going through difficult times, is your first reaction to say, how can I love on them? How can I demonstrate God's love? How can I help them with a personal need? Because it starts with you. You're God's person in that moment. Not who should I send them to, where they should go, but how should I respond? It's an opportunity for us to examine God working through us. I believe this week and the coming weeks, the church of Jesus Christ can shine like never before. When the world gets dark, when people are in fear, it's time when we can just let God's love shine in a whole different way. Not based around programs or events or even weekend big building church services, but just people living their faith for Jesus every day. I want to take a look at a story in the Bible today, and it's from the book of Matthew, so if you have your Bible, please get them. And Jesus comes along, and he teaches so many things, and he begins teaching the people through what we call parables. He just begins telling stories. And in these stories, he references also often to the kingdom of heaven. And we're going to take some time to talk about the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. And what does that mean? The very first this year, we started looking at eternity and what does that mean and how we're focused so much on the temporary of this life. And now with this COVID-19 upon us, all of a sudden our life does seem fragile and temporary. In fact, we've taken a, a, a month and looked at, looked at Philippians and said, can you imagine how would we live differently if we knew we only had 30 days left to live and it could be upon us? But am I living as one of God? We've also said eternity, we talked about heaven and we talked about hell and what they actually are. And if you missed those, I encourage you to watch those. But we said that eternity begins now. And when Jesus came, he brought the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God to earth. And in these stories, he helps us understand what they are. So today I want to start with Matthew chapter 13. And we're going to read some passages. We want to take a look at three questions that I believe apply to who we are and what's going on in our world now. And what does this story have to help us understand? So Matthew chapter 13, we're going to begin reading with verse number 24. It says, Then Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seeds in his field. That means he went out and he was planting. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. When the wheat was sprouted and formed heads, the weeds also appeared. The owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seeds in your field? Where then did the weeds come from? An enemy did this, he replied. So the picture is a farmer. It's springtime, which is coming upon us right now. And this farmer goes out and he plants good seed. And he tells us that that seed is wheat. So he's planting wheat. And an enemy comes in and plants some other seeds on top of it. They're tares. They're bad seeds. But they don't notice it until they start uh, giving some seed upon them. And all of a sudden the servants realize there's a problem here. And they want to know who is doing this. Later in verse 37, Jesus tells us the meaning of the story. He says, the good one who's sowing the good seeds is the son of man. That's another word for Messiah. Or it's Jesus. God is sowing the good seed. And he tells us in verse 39 that the evil one, the enemy, is the devil. And the devil is planning evil and hatred and harm among us. It's a story of how good and evil come together. So one of the questions we want to look at is where does good and evil come from? What are their sources? The story lays it out for us. There is two people planting. There is God. There is the devil. There's the good. There's the enemy. There's two seeds. There is good wheat and there's the weeds. This is good and evil. It's good and hatred. We also see two worlds coming together. There's the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of this world. There's light and there's darkness, but there's one field. And they're intertwined. They're living together. Good and evil coexist in this world. And we don't like it, but it's a part of our everyday life. We look around as we're going down the street, we go to the library, or we used to go to the library. You go to the library and there's all these good books around us and resources, there's Christian books there. But you can go another part of our community and there's a porn shop which is offering material which is very evil and tears down the dignity of people. You have one auto repair shop who's giving honest good work and treating people well and maybe even gives a discount to seniors or people are hurting. And then there's another auto repair shop just down the street 
who is scheming and ripping people off. You have two people at work. Let's say there's two ladies at work. One of them is working with integrity and honesty and giving the, the best she can to her work. And another person over here, she is scheming and cheating and trying to do everything she can to get ahead. We have two students. One is doing their homework and working in a different setting now at home, doing it with honesty, and another one is cheating and doing it evil. There's good and evil exists. We have a good father who takes his son out to the park and plays with him in the park, and there's another man at that park who's a pedophile who's looking at the same kid with the different horrible motives. Good and evil exist side by side. And we wonder, how does this come about? Where does it come from? God's goodness and Satan's hatred. That's the source of it. God wants good in your life. He creates good, but Satan comes along with his hatred, puts hate amongst us, and God creates the good. The devil, devil sows hatred, and it comes along for us. So we have sin, we have disease, we have brokenness, we have anxiety, we have pain in our lives, because that's what Satan brings into our lives. Another question, we wonder, why does God allow evil to exist? Why doesn't he just get rid of it all? The story goes on. Verse 28 says, the servants asked him, do you want us to go and pull them up, pull up the weeds, the bad stuff? And he says, no, he answered, because while you're pulling the weeds, you may root up the wheat that is with them. He says, you don't pull out the evil because you can harm the good that's there. So as a concern, if getting rid of bad, you get rid of the good. And the one thing is actually to understand what these plants were that he's talking about. Because when Jesus told a story, he gave really clear pictures for the people that were listening to him at that time. So it talks about the wheat. And a better word for weeds is the word tares. And there's a particular tare that was a common part of the day in this particular part of the country. And I got a picture of it. There's a picture of a tear, and this particular tear, the one closest to me, is called a darnel, and the wheat would be the one on your right. They look very similar. When they're planted, they grow up, they look identical. They're two green stalks that are growing up together, but when the seeds appear, you can tell what the different ones are. And that's when the story, it says, when the servants saw the seeds, they said, what do we do about this? Because the wheat, of course we know, is good. It provides good for us. The darnel, actually those seeds have a fungus in them that's poisonous. It could cause great harm. So they want to get rid of them. But while these are growing together, their roots are intertwined and they're connected together. And God is saying if you're going to remove one, you can harm the other one also. Think about in our lives. There's a part of us which are evil. There's a part of us which has some wrong and heartache within our lives. And God says, we can work, we can transform, and we can change. 2 Peter 3.15 says, bear in mind that our Lord's patience means salvation. We want God to get rid of all the evil in the world, get rid of all evil people, just get rid of them all. But if we got rid of all evil people, you know, there'd be no one listening to this message. In fact, there would be no one available to preach this message today either. Because there's some evil in all of our hearts. And God's in the process of transforming. In this verse, this verse says that God's patience brings salvation. Now, in this world, uh, a plant can't change. A, a wheat can't become a tear, and a tear can't become a wheat. But in the kingdom of God, life transformation happens. In the kingdom of God, people whose hearts are full of evil can come to know him and understand. And the gift of grace that we celebrated during communion can give transformation of your heart and your mind and soul and create a new person in you. Many of us are believers. We've experienced that life transformation, and God is continuing to work in your heart and life. And the same thing is there for those outside, those that don't know Jesus. Hopefully through this dark and difficult time, they will look to Jesus and life transformation can happen. So why does God allow evil to exist? Because of his patient grace. Because God is patient with us. Because God gives us grace, and he gives that grace for each one of us so we can understand. He's patient so you can come to know who Jesus is. He's patient with us who walk with him and we, we falter and we fall and get up. And even through this very painful, difficult time, he's patient that we can come to him and know who he is. One thing about his patient grace is judgment will come. That judgment's going to come at the end of it. And he's going to make everything right. And sometimes we're frustrated thinking, God, why don't you fix this? Well, he will. But in time, in this time, it's time for us to look at our hearts and our lives and 
Sometimes we can't tell the difference. Just like I can't tell the difference between a wheat and a Darnell. Same thing, we look around at other people, we go, oh, everybody's great and wonderful. Well, that person's bad, but we can judge people. And there's a lot of us who are believers. There's a lot of us who are make believers. We have the right outside look, but if you look in your heart, have you surrendered to God and are you walking with him? Well, God is the judge of the world. And the third question, how do we live in the kingdom in this world? So how do we live the way God wants us to in this broken world around us? It's full of fear and anxiety and evil. Continues on in verse 30. Jesus said, let both of these grow together, the evil and the good, until the harvest. At that time, I will tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned, then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. And in verse 40, he explains a little bit more about this. He says, as the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will weed out of his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. They will throw them into the fiery furnace, and there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their Father. He who has ears, let him hear. Saying, there will be a judgment. And when this judgment comes, God is the one who will judge good and evil, righteous and unrighteous, not us. Sometimes when we judge, we begun, become hatred. We become one that divides walls. We point fingers and we're pointing blame. And we can cause harm because we misjudge sometimes. We don't know the motives behind them. We want all evil gone. I want all this COVID-19 gone. I want all the hatred gone. I want all the bickering and fighting gone. But God says we're in this broken world and his patient grace is allowing people time to come to know him. And during this time, pray that many will come to know Jesus. Many people will look to him. Ephesians chapter one is a verse that, a passage that talks about this transformation in life. Look at this one with me. It says, they will throw them into, uh, yours. as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and following its desires and thoughts. It's saying we all had that part in our lives. We all had that place where we were there before. But God transforms what's in your heart. Verse four, he talks about the transformation that comes because of his love. He loves you and he gives you grace. Going on. Let's do the next verse, here we go. Verse eight, for it is by grace you've been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast, for we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So God gives us his grace. He gives it out of love. He transforms our hearts. He gives you hope. Why? So we can do good in his name. So we're experiencing life transformation. And this week, how do we live in the kingdom of God? We do it with a prayerful compassion. We do it with an understanding that God is working and God's providing. And so we don't just concern about ourselves. We reach out to others. We're praying for others earnestly. We're praying for God's light to shine bright. And you let compassion, God's compassion, work through you in this world. God's merciful patience is there. And we need to be patient with one another. At home, when we're all stuck together, be patient. Learn to demonstrate mercy and grace among each other. Learn to pray for each other. The people around you are living in fear and the people are hurting. Think of ways that you can reach out to them. Begin a phone calling blitz of people that you know and just check on them. How are they doing? Find out ways that you can help. Maybe share some of those resources that you have. Share some food with the people around you who can't get out or shouldn't be getting out. Reach out and let God's light shine bright this week. As this continues to grow around us, people's worlds get darker and scary around them. Many people have lost their hope and they've lost their purpose. And this is the time when you can help them to see yours is founded in Jesus. Reach out to them. I appreciate a young man in our church who's a basketball coach and he shared this last night and he was experienced something at the, at the grocery stores that some of you have as well. And Ben writes this, he says, I sit here choking back tears as I'm writing this. My trip to the grocery store this afternoon was so depressing. It was so gloomy. There was no hope in anyone's eyes in such a somber mood as a dark cloud hangs over us. I wanted to stand at the checkout lane and just yell to everyone, God's still in control and he always wins. 
I wanted to tell them we have hope in a resurrected Savior, Jesus Christ. I wanted to tell them one Friday, darkness took hold, but three days later, that darkness was defeated. And this darkness will be defeated we're facing today. We look forward to Easter. We look forward to it with hope. I could not tell them today, so I'm telling you, as we all have hope, we seek God through Jesus. Lent is a time of repentance, right? So let's all repent and take refuge in the grace of God through the one true Savior, Jesus Christ. And we are during this time of Lent, and unfortunately, many people in our country, and actually many Christians, look at Lent as a joking time. It's a laughter time. We kind of, we come into it with Mardi Gras, and it's all a big party, and who cares, and it's, it's a laughter, but this is a time God's calling us to repentance. He's calling us to refocus on life, and understanding that all around us is temporary and fragile, but he's there. He's present. I appreciate also a post that Danita Mahler wrote, and she said, Satan says this, I will cause anxiety and fear and panic, and I will shut down businesses and schools and places of worship and sports events, and I will cause economic turmoil, because that's what Satan does. He plants evil, and he brings heartache in life. And At the same time, Jesus is saying, I will bring together neighbors and restore the family unit. I'll bring back dinner, back to the kitchen table, I'll help people slow down their lives and appreciate what really matters. I will teach my children to rely on me and not on the world. And I will teach my children to trust me and not in their money, in their material resources. During this time of pain and difficulty, we're being tested. Do we really trust God? And is all of our passion put in the things of God and loving the people around us? Do we appreciate God's patient grace And are we prayerful and are we being compassionate to the people around us? I'm going to pray that God will still remove this COVID-19. That the predictions aren't going to be true, that it'll be stopped, it'll be changed. And I'm also going to pray that during this time, many, many people will come to know Jesus. And I pray that many of us followers will get a new look at our life and the priorities and the fragile of this life, but also the certainty of heaven and walking with him. With perfect compassion, we're going to trust God is the judge. God's going to make this all right. And God's going to bring it about in his time. But until then, his patience is with us. And one more reminder of that verse, Matthew 13, 43. He who has ears, let him hear. Would you ask God to speak to you and guide you today? Father, thank you for the story of Jesus. That meant so much to the people then and has through the centuries, but God, it does to us today. Father, we understand that you bring good in life. You desire good in our lives. But you have an enemy. We have an enemy, an evil one, who's brought so much heartache into this world. Father, there's many battles that people are facing and trying to maneuver through. I pray that we will look to you for direction and guidance. Father, for people who don't know your grace, I pray that today, this week, and the coming weeks, will be humbled and look to you. And Father, I pray that your followers all over this metro area, all over the country, all over the world, will demonstrate your love and grace and hope and faith And there'll be bright lights shining all over that many people will know you as a result of the compassion demonstrated by believers. God, I pray that you work in our hearts. In Jesus, I pray. Amen.